This episode of Unqualified is brought to you by State Farm, who has surprisingly great rates for your auto insurance. In 1999, my mom recorded me in our family room, delivering the lines for what I thought was a horror movie. My mom read the other roles, and I thought she gave a much better performance than I did. There was even a moment when I seriously considered not sending the tape because that would require a trip to the post office and an entire day's salary for postage. Not that I had a paying job. I was surprised when I received a phone call asking if I could audition in person. Then I realized that the casting director must have mixed up my tape with someone else's. I could have pointed out the error, but I'd never been to LA and wanted to go. So my parents gave me airline miles and I flew to Los Angeles, Burbank actually, where I auditioned every day for a week and slept on three different couches. At the week's end, my friend with the least comfortable couch offered to drive me to the airport. And because at the time it was hard to find good Mexican food in Washington state, I wanted one last burrito. My pager began buzzing just as our nachos arrived. There was a payphone in the back of the restaurant, and when I returned the page, I was told that I got the role. It was one of the biggest surprises of my life. I was also surprised to learn that Scary Movie was actually a comedy. This was after my audition. Speaking of nice surprises, State Farm provides coverage that meets your needs at a surprisingly great rate. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com for a quote today. Hey guys, today's guest is actor, comedian, and director Clark Duke. You know him from Kick-Ass, Hot Tub Time Machine, The Croods, Two and a Half Men, The Office, and his feature directorial debut, Arkansas, which was just released this month. Before we begin the episode, I want to remind you about our new Unqualified Experiment. I love hearing from you, and this idea came from wanting to share your thoughts and stories with the Unqualified community. It's a pretty simple experiment. Every week or two, I'm going to ask a question like the ones I ask our guests, and I'm hoping you'll call our new telephone number and leave a message with your answer. Last week's question was, to whom would you most like to apologize and why? I was really moved by your answers, and you can hear some of them at the end of the episode. For this week's question, I would like to know, what haven't you taken the time to learn about? So please give me a call at 310-421-9304. That's 310-421-9304. 9304. I really hope to hear from you. And now, Clark Duke. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. obligated to talk about mom yeah but i also hesitate because it's sort of lingering in my back burner brain all the time (laughs) uh, well it's also in mine because they show mom on nick at night so i fall asleep to an episode of mom almost every night like it's like friends and then mom comes on at 1 a.m so like i hear your voice for like 15 minutes a night every night as i fall asleep clark there's a lot to unpack there (laughs) Nick at night, why mom is on Nick at night, why you're watching Nick at I didn't even know Nick at night was still a, around. Yeah, no, they show friends and then mom. That's all they show at night. They show friends for like four hours and then mom for like four hours. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, there we are. Hey, are you a superstitious person? Uh, A little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm religious, so uh, some stuff, yeah. I mean, what are we talking about? I was just thinking the other day about how I wonder if actors and athletes are more prone to superstition. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's because, I think it's sort of twofold. And the idea that you're expected to perform very much in the moment, of course. Yeah. But it's like, you know, stepping up to plate sometimes as an actor. Right. So I was thinking, well, maybe there's comfort in superstition because you feel like you can potentially control something. But if things go wrong, you can also let yourself off the hook. Yeah, I'm sure there's something to that. I mean, I've actually made that comparison to like actors and and athletes before, because if you, you know, the list of people that like work consistently at like a high level, it's not that big. It's like in the hundreds, you know, which is like kind of comparable to being like a professional athlete. I can, I'm pretty cynical. So I, <laughs> so even when I have the urge, I will knock on wood sometimes, but it's kind of just for show. I do that constantly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like it's sort of like a faux humility act. Like, oh, right. well, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. But no, I like to have mental control. 
I don't like super, I, I don't, I'm wary of superstition because of my pride. <laughs> There's also the Venn diagram overlap of superstition with like OCD. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. So that's where it gets dangerous. Like when you're uh, like, are you checking to make sure your front door's locked five times out of some weird superstitious thing or right. just the, the compulsion? I had a an ex-boyfriend refuse to go on a plane. I've told this story before, but it sums up sort of some things. But he refused to get on a plane. He called me from the airport. He was like, I just know that plane's going to crash. Whoa. Um, Did it? No. Of course it oh. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh. But I kept thinking, if you're so convinced, why the fuck didn't you go back and tell all the other passengers? You're just going to let them fucking die? Because like, he's not crazy. <laughs> I don't know why that that just made. I think because we were so broke, and I remember like it took a lot of money for him to you know scrounge together for a plane. Anyway, it was all frustrating. It would have been a way wilder story if the plane crashed. Well, God, everything would have changed. Yeah, he he'd be a famous psychic right now. <laughs> Okay, so how would you describe, I grew up in Washington State mostly, I was born in Maryland, but how would you describe Arkansas? It's a state I've never been to. I hear it's beautiful, but I don't know much about it. It is very beautiful. It's a great place to grow up and be from, but if you're into, you know, art and culture and that kind of stuff, it's a harder place to live. If you want to like hunt fish, hike, it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, when I grew up there, I, I mostly just kind of felt like, oh, I don't belong here. Why do you think that? Well, I mean, I had an odd childhood in that I had this weird sojourn out here as a child actor for a few years. At five, right? Yeah. Yeah. My mom had a childhood friend we were visiting and she was working as like an actress out here and her manager saw me and was like, oh, we got to send him out. And so like they sent me on a commercial audition and I booked it and I ended up doing a ton of commercials and then CBS signed me to like a development deal at like six years old, like a holding deal. That is crazy. Yeah. So I've been over at Radford, you know, and on set since I was like six. So I ended up on this sitcom called Hearts of Fire with John Ritter and Billy Bob Thornton and Marky Post and also like Leslie Jordan, Conchata Farrell, Ed Asner, like the cast was crazy. And that ran for three years. But then after that, we just moved back to Arkansas and I'm glad we did because I think I got to skip all the, you know, the drug addiction and the more interesting parts of being a child actor. And I got <laughs> to have a, a nice normal childhood relatively. But but I knew pretty quick by the time I was like 12 years old, I um, I, I knew I wanted to be a movie director and, and, I, and I really love film and TV. So I knew I had to get out of there because I knew what I wanted to do for a living and it wasn't there. And your parents were really supportive? Yeah. My mom has always been just like, yeah, if you want to be pre run for president, that's fine. You can you can be president, sure. Do you know David Krumholtz? Uh, not, not personally, no. I, I know who he is. He has an interesting theory. He thinks that actors either come from unbelievably supportive parents. Right. You know, who like think you can just do anything. Right. Or like horrible fucked up people who are like, you know, convinced you're, you're like you're fucking shit or whatever. Yeah. I mean, there's something to that chip on your shoulder. I definitely feel like I have had that in some ways too, because, you know, being like a small bookish kid that was into like what at the time was like super nerdy stuff like comics were not cool in the 90s like that's why I have a hard time with everybody acting like they're all into the Avengers now and I'm like I know for a fact you were not reading the fucking Avengers because like it was like reviled and looked down upon to read the Avengers so like being into like all like being into like indie rock and comics and like all like it also everybody forgets like everything is so like everybody's so forgiving and like tolerant now but that was not the case is like a kid I love in the it 90s. that we all like there is something very unifying and childish in the like oh so now you think no, like, right it's like, there's a compulsion inside of us to well yeah I, I know that yeah I saw you guys didn't even think that was fucking cool but it really wasn't cool it was like actively uncool and that was what I was into I was you know I was into movies and comics and all that kind of stuff and in a place that was like a lot of like just just was not the place for it yeah. you know like yeah like rural Arkansas public school was not the place for that kid so yeah. I ended up graduating high school a year early I took all my senior classes at night Night, oh. my junior year. So you, did you go to prom? I went to the junior prom, not the senior prom, because I wasn't there. How was junior prom? It was fine. Kind of uneventful. Like, mm. I don't... All right. I don't nothing really there. Any... Nothing there, Clark. Yeah, nothing, right. there. nothing there. Yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah, sorry. Nothing there. Uh, <laughs> then you went to Loyola, right? Yeah, yeah. I went to Loyola Marymount to, uh, to film school. Did you live in the dorms there? Briefly. I'm too neurotic to 
like be share a in. small space. It's mostly about sharing the bathrooms. You know, basically the whole like Corona thing going on right now is like, cause I'm like, I have hypochondriac and OCD tendencies and I've always been like a type A clean freak lunatic. So like, I've always carried hand sanitizer and wet ones around. So like, this is basically, this whole thing has been like a confirmation of all my worst fears and also like, aha, yeah. I was right. Yeah. Like I told everybody. So I, you know, the, the dorm bathroom was hard for me. <laughs> hey, what was it like though? How was your experience on Mom being a guest star? It was good. I mean, I love you and Allison. You know, me and Allison did a movie together years ago, this uh, this Eddie Murphy movie, which was such a weird experience for both of us that um, it's always like that thing of like seeing like an old war buddy or something, you know, when you see somebody yeah. you worked with a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it was good. I um, I mean, I was only there for like a few days, so it's like I don't have a great sense of it. I mean, it's such a smooth running machine, too. Like I had just done all the... I did that last season of Two and a Half Men. I will say I love I really love multicam. Like that's that's the best job in the world. What do you love about it? I mean, I think it's just the immediate response of the audience. It also there's something that feels like old timey show business that I like so much. Like it's like we're putting on a show. Like there's something nostalgic about it. It's so fun. Like every part of it's fun. Like none of it's that hard. Like <laughs> like I really feel like we've all done ourselves this huge disservice by making all these one hour dramas and like single cam shows on TV. <laughs> because it's like the multi-cam lifestyle you can still like have a normal life too yeah you can still like have a life because if you're shooting a single cam show that shoots for nine months a year like you work like 12 or 14 hours a day for nine months a year like you just get burned out in a lot of course like being in town and the live audience and our cast and right you know what everything's it's just i'm so so fortunate it's such an incredible job I think the first few years, my brain, it took a while to really adjust to the rapid line memorization of the process. Yeah. And puzzle solving in that format, you know, blocking is, you work on it in in a very different way than you would in yeah. single camera. And I really enjoy that process of figuring out how we make this play. It's a very different kind of acting too. It is. It is. It's, it's not like, because you any, like whatever training you had as an actor is sort of not applicable. I think you hit on the, the major difficulty of it, which is finding that line because I think more so than in other formats, finding the line between broadness and sincerity is difficult yeah. because there are few clues in the dialogue sometimes. Right. I remember on when I was doing Two and a Half Men, I would just watch John Cryer because I would be like, how's he going to read this one? Because I, I would read something and be like, well, this isn't funny at all. And then I would watch him read it and he would just perform it into fucking into existence. And I'm like, oh, that's... I mean, I think, I think TV... And multicam especially and specifically is also, it's really just about like personal charisma and likability of the person. And and I think this is very true of of you and Allison. Like it's people that you'd want to hang around with or hang out with every week. Thanks. I think that speaks to probably why you're good at at the podcast too. Like it's like a personality thing. Like you've got to, and that's not something you can teach. Thanks. And I used to describe it too, as it's a format where I didn't realize there were places to hide until I started doing multicam. And it it feels like, oh, there's nowhere to hide. Right. (laughs) And I mean that, you know, physically, but also character and in just sort of, yeah, the level of exposure but I think you're right in that your own personality inevitably comes through. And and it's interesting how the writers will sort of shape to your strengths. Yeah. I felt that way watching Friends. And I was a guest star in the last season of Friends. And it was just fucking terrifying. Oh, God. It was... I, be, I mean, during the last season, I bet. <laughs> yeah. And I hadn't really done the format. And I was on Friends. It was... Yeah. I think that if anybody remembered me from the cast or crew, they would remember a very quiet person just <laughs> slinking around, trying not to be... Known noticed <laughs> i just you know because i write also so for me i just had such a blast like doing a take and then huddling up with the writers yeah. and pitching lines and like as a performer it's it's the best job i think everybody should try it and then they'd quit making single camera dramas we just make multi cams <laughs> clark can i ask you some life questions please okay what is your favorite ice cream flavor coffee coffee all right uh what would you like to eat for your last meal whoa do I know it's my last meal when I'm eating it? Let's say no. <laughs> uh, I guess fried chicken, probably. Mm, all right. Who has influenced your career the most? Oh, wow. Um, 
Wow, that's hard. I mean, a lot of people, like, as far as, like, you know, I've, I've wanted to be a movie director since I was, like, 12. So, I mean, now that I've finally done that and, like, got to do that, I would say, like, a person that I really admired the career of in the world, like, like maybe, like, Steven Soderbergh, just how he jumps around and, you know, he does everything from operating the camera to editing to different genres to acting. Like, he, he's pretty hard to beat. I love that you are interested in all elements of filmmaking. Yeah. Okay, uh, what is the best or worst advice you've ever been given? Oh, man. <laughs> I don't know. That's... <laughs> I'm trying to think. I mean, I had a professor in college that really changed the way I looked at acting named Barry Primus. So, I mean, like, I don't know if that's exactly advice, but as far as like something really useful that I took moving forward and used a lot. Do you mind my asking? Is it a long theory? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's long. I mean, he just, he, he does method stuff. So just the, just that whole approach. So like, just like using physicality. The dumbest example is like, if you're supposed to be out of breath in the scene, do a bunch of jumping jacks before like, and that seems really obvious, like when you say it out loud, but at the time it was like a real light bulb thing, you know, substituting your own emotions and memories and stuff for the character. Clark, what was his name again? Barry Primus. He's actually in my movie, Arkansas oh, really? too. Yeah. Barry Primus. He's, Has he written anything? Yeah. He wrote and directed a film called Mistress in the 90s. He's an old character actor. He was in like Scorsese's first movie and stuff. Um, cool. He's a cool guy. I'm going to check him out. Thank you. Okay. What makes you laugh? Uh, Matt Berry, the actor. I don't know if I know who that is. I'm embarrassed. He's this British actor. He has this show called Toast of London. And yeah. he was on IT, IT Crowd and Snuffbox and um, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, which I still think is Oh, one of the yes. Oh, my God. He's I Sanchez. He's oh, the guy my with God. the. He's got the crazy voice. I haven't thought about that in years. Nothing makes me laugh harder than Dark Place. Toast of London is on Netflix and everyone should go watch it because that makes me laugh harder than anything in the world. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. I need some of that. Okay. What's your greatest fear? Heights. <laughs> Do you get nervous in planes? No, I don't, which is weird. I mean, I guess fear of heights is really just fear of death though, right? Yeah. So I guess death. I don't know. <laughs> I wonder. Probably failure. I'd probably put, actually, I'd put failure above those. <sighs> yeah, I feel that. Oh, God. <laughs> what is a trait you dislike in others? Um, I'm trying to think of how to word this. I don't like know-it-alls. And I've found in general that the dumber the person is, the more they think they have all the answers and have it all figured out. And I mean, this kind of just applies to like all of civilization right now. Yeah, I guess like know-it-alls. I'm not a fan of. I think you're you're right in saying that. I'm sure I'm guilty of being a know-it-all. I mean, I'll just make shit up that sounds... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just assume I don't know anything at all times. Um, if you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would it be? I'd like to live in New York. I haven't really worked there or spent a lot of time there. Like, I've got to, like, making movies, I've got to live, you know, in a lot of cool places. Miami and Vancouver and Toronto and... Atlanta and, you know, like the usual New Orleans been really fun to live in. But I have never really spent any amount of time in New York and I'd really like to. I got to live in London for like three months one time, but never, never New York. I've, I've only been in New York a handful of times and I, I always think it's so cool when I'm there. I like that answer. I've only shot there a couple of times, but it would not be accurate if I started launching into the saying like, oh, Clark, you would love New York. Oh right. my God, <laughs> right, you right. just love it. You uh, would like, <laughs> I don't know if I would love it. I kind of, I kind of figure I wouldn't like stay, but I would like to try it. What has been the most stressful experience of your life? Um, professionally, the period where it was like, Right before we were going to know if we could make this movie or not, it was like this horrible weeks or months long process of like waiting to see if you had cast and financing. Your cast is so incredible. And I like in putting those pieces together feels like like one of the impossible puzzles that's scattered out like in the living room right now. <laughs> I would imagine with everyone's like schedules and. Yeah, it's and nobody, you know, nobody's getting nobody's doing this for money. Like it was a very much an, a small indie film. So like. If anybody's doing it, it's because they want to do the movie. But yeah, it's like, all right, you've got John Malkovich has this week free in October. It's like, okay. That's so rad. But yeah, but that, it, it, it is an impossible puzzle. Like, it's, it's really a miracle that anything ever gets made. I know. I mean, I've been trying to, I've been trying to make this for so long. Like, I, I, I optioned the book that it's based on like 10 years ago. Do you know what I've optioned? No. <laughs> there was this article in the Los Angeles Times maybe a decade ago. Yeah? Maybe more. It was called like Earth Girl Jen, this girl up in Ojai who would stand on the street corner with these tassels on, just tassels and like a bikini bottom. And she would twirl the tassels around and be like, 
go Earth. The tassels are on her nipples. I yeah, just want to be ta- clear. Yeah, okay. and so okay. and so the older members of the Ojai community were like, "Get Earth Girl Jen out of here," or whatever. And so and she's like, "I'm not leaving." <laughs> well, she's twirling around on the sidewalk. Uh, so I contacted her to option her story, and yeah. she wanted five thousand dollars. And I was like, "I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I, could. I was like." <laughs> What was the term? 5000 for how long? You know, I'm sad to say, Clark, the negotiations didn't go much further. It fell through. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, um, I like adapting stuff. So you adapted a book that you liked. <laughs> yeah. That seems like, like a better the, um... strategy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. I mean, they're making a movie about Angeline, I just heard the other day. Oh, really? Yeah. I got an audition. No, I think they already... Um... <laughs> Things are just not going my way. <laughs> it was, oh man, honestly, you would have been fucking great as Angeline, though. Like, Thanks. Well, it's, um, I forget who it is, but I, I saw they've cast somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Clark. One of the best jokes I've ever made was uh, in an interview, somebody asked me, What's like the one role you were really heartbroken you didn't get? And I was like, um, well, on the Muppet show, it was down to me and Kermit the Frog, and they ended up going with Kermit the Frog. And I, I just, <laughs> and I was like, that's the, that's what, I was like, that's the best joke I've ever made. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Um, oh, what haven't you taken the time to learn about? I mean, almost everything, probably. I don't <laughs> You know what I wish I knew, and I, and I actually was thinking about getting a book, is uh, I feel like I should know more about car engines and how cars work in general. Oh, really? Why? Do you have that kind of mechanical curiosity? Yeah. Yeah. I just, just curiosity, and it just seems crazy that, like, um, like, like my, I bought and remodeled this old house in, like, 2013, and um, I, I kind of enjoyed, like, the rebuilding of it, like, just learning how, like, stuff works. But I really, you know, don't know jack shit about Car engines. I should, I should look into that. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, I admire that. I should have came up with a more artistic no, answer. No, no, like, no, uh, no, no. Like Renaissance art no, or something. No, 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 no. What are you going to do with that? And I was like. Can't go to Ralph's and Renaissance art. Small engine repair was yeah. what I came up with. <laughs> <laughs> it's. I'm actually going to enroll at the University of Phoenix and get a get a degree at night in small engine repair. I love that. I bet we could. Totally. All right. I asked this question the other day. I went with linguistics. Mm, I don't have the patience. Oh, really? Yeah. There's certain things that just geography and linguistics interest me. When you say geography, do, what do you mean? Like like mountains or? or... I really love maps. Oh, I just okay. really love maps. I like looking at them. So cartography. Yeah, cartography. But I also like the idea of how different environments influence culture, you know, just sort of uh, through yeah. biology and necessity or whatever, that kind of shit. But I don't know anything. I bet we get you some books. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by The Pill Club. Do you need to renew your birth control prescription? Want to switch your birth control? Maybe try it for the first time. Whether you know the brand you want or you're looking for help finding the best option, the Pill Club medical team has your back. With the Pill Club, you'll never have to make a trip to the doctor or wait in line at the pharmacy. The Pill Club is a birth control subscription prescribed by a medical professional and delivered straight to your door for free in discreet packaging. The Pill Club carries over 120 FDA-approved brands. Most brands of birth control are free with insurance or Medicaid. Otherwise, prices start as low as $7 per month without insurance. Right now, when you go to thepillclub.com slash unqualified, The Pill Club is offering a $10 donation to bedsider.org for every unqualified listener who becomes a patient. Your donation will help low-income individuals get access to birth control through bedsider.org. That's thepillclub.com slash unqualified to get your first birth control care package. That's thepillclub.com slash unqualified to get your first birth control care package and donate to help more women in need of affordable birth control. Remember, thepillclub.com slash unqualified. You must use the link to make a donation. She was so cute. Who, who, living or dead, would you invite to your dream dinner party? Oh, wow. 
Uh, Robert Altman. Will you tell me what you like about Robert Altman? The first Robert Altman movie I saw was The Long Goodbye, and it's still one of my favorite movies. I just think he's one of those guys that, you know, you could watch the movie and it doesn't have to say, like, who directed it. You know who directed it by looking at it. Like, But, but tell me why, if you don't mind, because I didn't study much film. I've seen a couple of... Altman films. I mean, it's just a, it's just such a specific vibe. I, I think he was the first person to do this. He would like Mike, you know, he does the long oneers um, that'll be like minutes long and um, the constant moving camera and the zoom, which like gives you this voyeuristic effect, um, which almost it, it, it does a thing with your brain watching it that it's almost it's almost kind of the similar effect to watching a documentary because there's something very unnatural about a zoom. Like and I think psychologically, like cameras are sort of constructed like the human eye and um you know, our eyes don't zoom. Like, that's like a thing that's not natural. So it, it does something interesting watching it. He would also mix audio in a really specific way where he would have like, you know, 12 actors or 20 actors and they've all got lobs on. So everybody's talking over each other. So it's it's less about focusing on a specific line of dialogue and more about taking in the um kind of the whole the whole essence of the scene. You could even say the mise en scene if you wanted to sound really obnoxious. I, I don't know. I just I just love his vibe. Like it's sort of paranoid and funny, and I guess it's the way he used the camera more than anything. Do you think that it that um, he wanted his audience to be aware of his direction style? Yes and no, because at the same time, like there's something about the way he shot stuff with the audio all overlapping and the long takes that you sort of. I mean, there's parts of it that it's like the the goal that you're after as an actor, which is to like seem. Yeah, I mean, you're all. I mean, most of the time, not on the multi cam as much, but, but you're kind of striving to get as close to reality as possible. Like the goal is, you want people to forget they're watching something that's not real. Like right. that's sort of the ultimate suspension of disbelief, and that's sort of the the crazy thing about what Altman does is you're watching this stuff, and it's all actors, and they're all famous actors. But there's something about the cumulative effect of them all talking over each other and the camera not cutting that it starts to seem real or you forget that it's not real. Even though, like you said, it's sort of the most, hey, look at me, I'm directing a movie thing. Well, with the Zoom, there's the, you're not a voyeur anymore and the director is indicating where your focus should be, of course, sure, like, yeah. um, on a particular character. And so there's an awareness there. I'm not critical at all. I'm just curious. And I truly don't know if I prefer directors that I forget about or if directors that remind me how brilliant they are. I just don't know. I think I like the ones that remind you. Right. Okay, sorry. Go on. I interrupted your dinner party. No, but, no, no. I, but, but wait, you were going to say something and I could see like a twinkle in your eye. Like, what do you mean? Who else? No, I was just going to say it's really interesting the thing you point out about Altman because that's, that's, um, that is really interesting that he's doing the thing to most remind you you're watching a movie while somehow making you forget you're watching a movie. So I, th I think Altman's brilliant. It sort of like questions the idea of how did Altman want the audience to participate, you know, active yeah. or, or not. Or maybe, the, maybe it's the constant shift in an Altman movie that keeps that unique. I don't know. I don't know. There's also sort of just a hanging out vibe to a lot of his movies too. Um, like the, especially the big ensemble ones like Nashville and stuff like that, like that you see like Richard Linklater do later with like his movies. I don't know. I wish I could have him at this dinner party and ask him. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but and then you mentioned, okay, your next person. David Bowie. I'd get David Bowie there. Yeah. All right. Nobody's cooler than Bowie. Who else would be cool? David Hockney. David Hockney, the painter. The painter. I'd like to talk to him. Okay. Brian De Palma, I'd like to have there. Just get a bunch of movie directors sitting around talking. Why do I feel like Brian De Palma, I don't know. What about De Palma? I don't know. Would dominate? <laughs> I think it's because you feel that way because every photo of Brian De Palma, he's wearing a safari suit. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> He's dressed like he's dressed like a like he's on safari. That's why. Oh, he's prepared in a different way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Peter Bogdanovich. Okay. I would put Bogdanovich on there. Who I got to meet a few months ago. Oh, you did? For like, yeah, just for like five minutes, but it was great. He's so uh, he's so dapper and smart. Yeah. Um. In one word, how would you like to be remembered? Kind. I like that. Yeah. I think that's great. Okay. You're a big professional wrestling fan. <laughs> this is what it says on your thing here that I have in front of me. So maybe you aren't. Are you a huge professional wrestling fan? Yes. Okay. So let's say I'm 13. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to go, but also my friend is having a sleepover. 
Right. How do you, how would you win me over? Well, like what what does the match have to offer? What does professional wrestling have to offer that I haven't experienced yet? Well, they have corn dogs at the arena. I don't know if that sweetens the deal. Sure. I like a corn dog. I think it's something that had to grab you as a kid. Like I I loved it when I was like 5 years old. It's like the first thing I ever recall watching. I don't have a real scientific answer like for why I liked it, but I, there seemed to be just based on when I go to the shows, it seems to mostly be other 35-year-old guys there. So like there was definitely a moment in time. It's probably as simple as just like Hulk Hogan. You know what I mean? Like there's just some characters that like grab you as a child and then you're hooked. Do you think there's a correlation between your love of comic books and superheroes and professional wrestling? 100%. Yes. They're both very definitive. There's good guys, there's bad guys. Yes. And there's like sometimes external forces or whatever, but there aren't too many shades of gray, right? Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. And it's also both extremely violent, but there's no repercussions for the violence. Like nobody really dies in the comics. Yeah. Like the, if wrestling was real, they'd just be covered in bruises and blood and stuff. So yeah, I'm sure there's absolutely some correlation there. Like, I mean, I think little boys just like violence too, maybe. But I wonder, no, if there's like, if there's certainty and comfort in like, oh, I recognize a bad guy. Oh, I recognize a good guy. Yeah, I think you're making some smart connections because the lack of shades of gray is exactly what's comforting and what's missing from real life. I'm sure the reason I like it now is partly, you know, nostalgia. Um, It's like comfort food because it was like this thing I loved as a kid. I got out of it after college. I really stopped. I didn't really watch it much after high school, but then um, when we were promoting the first uh, Hot Tub Time Machine, me and Cordry got to, uh, Rob Cordry, not Nate Cordry, got to, uh, we got to guest host Monday Night Raw. And so I hadn't watched the show in, in a f- quite a few years at that point, but we actually, the, the one, because the movie came out in, uh, I think, March, so the one that we got to guest host was the day after WrestleMania. So they sent us to WrestleMania in Phoenix and then the show the next night for Raw. And um, I had such a blast. And I befriended a lot of the wrestlers because they're all, they were the same age as me. And I was like, oh, this is wild. This thing I really love, like now it's like guys my age doing it. So like a couple of the guys, like The Miz and Dolph Ziggler, like I've been friends with those guys for like a decade. Uh, That's awesome. That. Yeah. I have a seven-year-old boy and he's, you know, he's all about like, the violence and the... Oh, yeah. But it, it is interesting, the, the idea of, like, safe violence, but I don't know. Are you hesitant to let him watch wrestling or... or... No. Is that awful? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think, no. If I had a seven-year-old, I, I'd be taking him to wrestling. Yeah. You can't... You know what? I'm I'm a big believer in that, like, you really can't shield kids or hide kids from too much because, like, there's nothing more vulgar or filthier than, like, other children... Yeah. Like, like I just remember, like, always thinking it was so silly that, like, they didn't want kids to watch rated R movies. And I'm like, have you ever been around, like, a group of, like, 11-year-olds? They're just, like, saying the filthiest stuff. Like, like you're never going <laughs> to... Like, I don't know. Like, I my, I remember, um, and this is part of why, like, I probably wanted to be a director and got, like, into uh, movies is my mom just told the local video store, like, let him rent whatever he wants. So, like, I remember, like, watching, like, Reservoir Dogs and Boogie Nights and, like, all this stuff that, like... I absolutely should not have been watching, you know? <laughs> but I don't think it, like, ruined... I don't think I'm, like, scarred for life or anything. Like, <laughs> I want to talk about your movie, Arkansas. Would you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah. Okay. So Arkansas is... It's, it's from a book I adapted, uh, also called Arkansas by John Brandon. It's a great book. McSweeney's published it. I read it, like like I said, like 10 years ago and just loved it because the dialogue was so good. It reminded me of like Elmore Leonard or, you know, Tarantino or something like that. It's a, it's a crime story, kind of like a Coen Brothers tone type of thing about this drug kingpin in Arkansas from the 80s to the present that Vince Vaughn plays. And then in the present day, me and Liam Hemsworth play these two very handsome um, one slightly more handsome than the other guys who <laughs> work at like the bottom tier of, uh, of Vince Vaughn's organization. And through like a series of uh, mishaps, we screw up so bad that basically he has to kill us and we end up on like this collision course. That sounds amazing. And I bet when you have like such great actors and a smaller budget, that kind of brings out the best, I think. Yeah, like we're all in this together, like putting on a show thing. Yeah, the, this, the only stuff, the acting stuff was a pleasure because everybody I named off is so good. And like, you know, Vivica Fox and John Malkovich and Michael Kenneth Williams, like, like everybody in the movie is really good. So that 
made it really easy in a lot of ways. But the stuff that's so hard that I didn't know before, just because I hadn't made a movie before, so you don't know, is um, like if you don't have any money or time, like don't try to do stuff in cars. Don't try to like action so hard. Right. Like like there's so much stuff in the movie that um just we were not like super qualified to do, but we did it somehow. But um, you know, it's basically you need money or time and like we didn't have it either, but it worked. <laughs> did you shoot in Arkansas? We shot a little bit in Arkansas. So I was gonna shoot the whole movie in Arkansas and this while we were there location scouting, the state told us they couldn't give us the tax credit. Oh. Which was like the difference in like a million dollars or something, which for a movie this size, that's like, you know, that's like a quarter or a third of your budget. So we ended up going to uh, Alabama, but we did shoot a little bit in Arkansas. Some of the the locations that just don't exist anywhere else. Like there's these famous bathhouses in downtown Hot Springs where I'm from. So we got that we filmed there. The one we filmed in is actually a museum. So that was pretty cool. Did you enjoy editing? I enjoyed editing for a while. And then I was like, I hate editing. I hate like everything. And then I kind of came back around to enjoying it again at the end. Editing's rough just because you you lose, you just lose the forest for a trees. Like there's a point that, like there was a point that I'm like, I don't know if the movie's any good. I have no, like the movie may suck. I have no reaction to the movie. Like, cause you've just, I've seen it so many times. I could recite the entire movie to you right now from memory. So it's like, I don't ever need to see it again because it, it's like seared in my brain at this point. I would imagine that like going through the, like the decision process and maybe there's an expression like that you love, but I don't know, building, crafting the story, especially when you have great performances. I think this is the reason that I have such a, um, I'm so impressed by like Steven Soderbergh who edits his own stuff because the thing that I learned was I need someone that A is like smarter than me and better at this than me and B is not as attached to it like you need some objectivity that comes from like because me like having written it directing it being in it you know there's a tendency to be like well we can't cut that that took eight hours to shoot you know what I mean and like you can't think like that in the editing because that doesn't matter so like having like my editor um Patrick Don Vito which is the best name and he's the best guy but he did a he had just done green book which won you know best picture right before he did my movie so like i very much trusted his opinion on stuff and it was nice to have him there and he's really talented but it was nice to have somebody that i like definitively thought like okay this person knows more than me about this like trust their opinion they only have the movie's best interests in mind it looks beautifully shot it just looks yeah it is It, it um yeah, our, our our DP is this guy named Steven Meisler, who um is uh he did Godless for Netflix. I don't know if you saw that, but he's a uh, really brilliant. We use like we use almost no lights in the movie, which is pretty crazy. So like that was the other way that we shot the movie in like twenty five days is there's no lights. And what time of year was it? It was uh like September, October, November, but it was in Alabama, so it was still really hot. And then for the last week, it was freezing cold, it, like a switch flip. It has a beautiful, like, lushness to it. Yeah. I was actually after that lushness because there's like a weird, I want to have that kind of sticky, like, green feeling that the South has where you can hear cicadas. I put a, I, I inserted a ton of cicadas in the, in the background of a lot of scenes, too. Do you have a favorite rainy day movie that you can watch again and again? I want to know like the more of the guiltier pr- pleasures. You want to know like the comfort food, like yeah, the easily digestible, I guess. Yeah, mine would be uh, Saving Silverman. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah, I love Saving Silverman. I've watched it like a million times on cable. It always is paired with a movie I did called Sex Drive, which made me really happy. Yeah, who who wrote Sex Drive? John Anders and John Morris. I feel like I auditioned for that. No, I feel like I'm too old. <laughs> I'm too old to have auditioned for that. I don't, uh, it was, I mean, it was like 2008 or something. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It was a long time ago. Isn't Amanda Peet so yeah, great in that? Yeah, she's great. She's great in everything. Um, I know. She's got such a good vibe. I would say my other like movie that if it's like that in that vein, that if it's on, I just stop and watch like Casino. Yeah, that's a good one. That's my favorite movie period, I think. I haven't thought um, about Casino for a minute, but I like that choice. Yeah. Sharon Stone in that movie is one of my all-time oh. favorite performances by anybody ever. She's magnetic. You can't not watch her. And, and with a cast like that, she still continues to just... Oh, she blows everyone away. In that. By her. Yeah, nobody can keep up with her in that movie. She's unbelievable. And everything, like the wardrobe and the, the production design, like that movie is just perfect. And the music. That's a good one because I often think of like a sick day movie as lighter fare. 
But the great thing about Casino is that it's deliciously heavy. Yeah. Or it's still palatable. It's not Sophie's choice. Like, you can, <laughs> you know, yeah. you can... Uh, yeah. It, well, Goodfellas is like that, too. They're both... Um, the back half, not as much, but they're both real watchable. I mean, they're both a lot of fun. Yeah, the first yes, half of both of them are yeah. really fun. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. This episode of Unqualified is brought to you in part by Best Fiends. We all know there really is only one match three style game worth playing. It's the one with an actual storyline, cool collectible characters, and nonstop action packed adventure. It's the one with literally thousands of challenging puzzles to solve. And yes, I'm using the word literally correctly. Of course, I'm talking about best fiends. You meet your best fiends early in their careers. They don't have much experience, but they have heart. I recognized a little piece of myself in each of them. And so I began to assemble the perfect team. I watched them grow as we solved puzzle after puzzle, working hard and playing hard. Today, my best fiends are ready to go anytime and anywhere. I'm really proud of what they have become. With new challenges and levels added all the time, there's never a boring moment. So download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Okay, should we call Savannah? Sure. Hi. Oh, hey, Savannah. Hi. How are you? I'm doing good. I just got off work. Oh, good. Well, so tell us what's going on. So I just moved from L.A. to Idaho. I'm, I'm 25, so it's like I'm in a weird place of making friends and meeting people because I'm not in school anymore and, like, you know, don't really hang out at bars and stuff. But uh, I've been, like, casually dating here and there, and whenever I get, like, intertwined with men, I keep managing to get, like, involved with the most possessive, scary men. And, like, I'm very upfront with them at the beginning. Like, I have sick parents. I have to take care of them. I need to work. Like, I have limited emotional investment. Like, I just want to casually date. And they always end up, like, freaking out once we split. It's just always a big hassle. And then with just male companions, just friends, at some point, my male friends that I've made here give me an ultimatum that it's all or nothing or they come on to me or something. And, like, I'm so, like, ridiculously clear. Like, to where it's kind of, like, mean, I feel and it doesn't seem to go through and I don't get physical with any of these men, the ones that I date or the ones that I am trying to build a friendship with. I'm just at a loss. I don't know what to do. And I'm not sure if it's like, because I'm like new in town and like, you know, or because it's, I'm used to LA and not small town. Um, I've had like a really scary situation happen recently and that was unfortunate. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, I'll totally talk about it. I actually gave like a real life Chad, which I think it's so <laughs> funny that, the chats that you do are so lousy. <laughs> I went on two dates with him and like we only texted for maybe 10 days. And I very politely told him that I wasn't interested in continuing to date. And he started driving by my house. He'd call me like 30, 40 times a day. And then oh, he no. started threatening me. Yeah, it was wild. It was so wild. He, he was, he's 32 also. I'm 25. Like I was like, wow. And he started threatening me, like threatening to like, I see you on the street. I'm going to run you over with my car. Oh, my God. Did he text you that, that he was going to run you over with his car? Yeah, I went, I filed, I ended up filing police report and got Okay, good, okay. And, like, that's not normally how I do things. Like, I'm a little more, like, I want to handle my own. I don't ever want to negatively impact anybody's life. So I, like, actively try to, you know, I tried to resolve it, but it just got to a point where I was like, oh, my God. He changed his Facebook profile picture to, like, him being covered in blood. All this stuff. And I was like, what is going on? Like, why? Like, I would, I'm not that exciting. Like, what are you doing? What an awful, awful experience. I'm just dumbfounded. Absolutely dumbfounded. Right. His friends will make jokes online and use my name, make jokes about the fact that I got a restraining order against him. And I'm like, what? Who makes jokes? Like, oh, you scared? I'm like 115 pounds and five pounds. I'm tiny. He, and he's like a bigger dude. And it's like, you, you and your friends think it's funny that you scared a little girl. And needing to file for a protective order that you joke about it on the internet? What in the world? Like, where am I? What is going on? Savannah, when was the last time this guy reached out to you? He was served his restraining order February 25th, a temporary one. And then I went to court and got the full one. And that was served, I think, March 14th. 
first. This is all pretty like new. And so Savannah, I have a couple of questions. What attracted you to Chad? Did you have any inkling that he was a little bit psychotic? So I like to ship post memes because I think they're funny. And he also, he added me and I added, because I was new to the area and I've gone to bonfires and stuff and didn't know. Like I was like, oh, maybe I've run into him and making new friends. I just got here. And so I added him and he also was posting. This is, I shouldn't, I, yeah, I should have done more research. But we had a lot of mutual friends and he was posting things that I thought were really funny. And he messaged me one day and was like, oh, these are, your memes are so great. Like keep posting. And I was like, yeah. And then we started chatting and like, he asked me if we could go eat. And I was like, yeah, of course it was. Sounds good. It was a nice first date. You know, there was nothing alarming about it to me. Well, and then through the so, 10 days of texting, he started getting like a little possessive. Like if I was busy at work or out with my friends, he'd be like, why aren't you responding? And I was like, you need to hold off. You know, like, what are you doing? And that's, we did the second date and I was like, nah, I can't do this. That's really good. I'm glad that you got the restraining order and the court will be familiar with you. Because, you know, a lot of people, I think, don't take stuff maybe as seriously as they should. So I think that's great that you did that. One of my friends, Cody, once I wasn't willing to be in a relationship with him, he just called me every demeaning name in the book. Told me he hoped I get raped and pregnant. Jesus. Oh, my gosh. Where are you finding these guys? I have this, like, savior complex. So I keep giving him another chance. I'm like, you're going to be my friend. Just accept it. And then this happens again. And I've just had such a hard time with keeping, you know, maintaining friendships. Do you have uh, female friends? I have tons of great female friends, really strong female friendships out here. And I, I go to them for a lot of stuff, but I'm a tomboy. I like to ride dirt bikes. I work in cars and I, like, I'm, I'm dirty half the time. And so it's nice to have masculine energy around. And also with all this, this Chad stuff, I'm like, it would be nice to have some homeboys just so I feel a little safer. Yeah. <laughs> I guess, I, you know, I went from Washington to Los Angeles and I did feel, you know, there's obviously a lot of differences in the kinds of people that I would have daily encounters with, you know? Yeah. And I grew up in the suburbs. Yeah. And I hate to like stereotype a Northwest guy. And I'm sure like there's, you know, all kinds of subcategories. But I, I wonder if you move to a town where maybe people marry younger or they want uh, an... They do. All these... Oh my gosh, they do. All these girls have like one of the girls that I'm kind of friends with. She's, on her, she's pregnant with her fourth kid and she's just turned 21. It's so opposite of LA. And I grew up in like ghetto LA, like bad LA. And so and then I come to like North Idaho and I, and I love it here. It's beautiful, absolutely. But I'm, it's just the difference of the, the way we interact. How long have you been there? I moved here in June, but I lost my whole summer up here because I broke my collar road and, my, and then my dad had a stroke, so I didn't get to like be too social. So my social times have been recently. Savannah, I, I don't know if you're going to like my advice. Idaho is beautiful and, you know, and it sounds really idyllic. And I... I love I love that coming from LA that you love it. But Savannah, I think that maybe it might be the time in your life where you sort of sit back and wait for a minute. Okay. Like stop trying so hard. Yeah, like, well not not that not that I not that I don't mean to suggest that you're trying hard or anything. And I totally understand the desire for companionship. I love having, you know, my partner with me. Yeah. But I think maybe you're clouding that desire to have companionship with your judgment. And especially because sometimes good guys are, they're just, they're harder to find. You know, I would, um, I would lean on your friends, but, but I, I would just take a minute because, you know, there is, there's some degree of truth to that idea that, it, you know, once you stop looking, you tend to, people tend to find, find someone. yeah, I think so. And it might take you a minute if there are cultural differences in this community for you to be able to um, calibrate your judgment, you know, with like, yeah, just um, if a guy's opening line is you've got great memes, that's a red flag. <laughs> just <for> all, <laughs> they just are really good, list. though. <laughs> <laughs> I, like he was being honest, you know. We'll have to, we'll have to check him out. <laughs> I've hesitated to like date now, and I've been trying to focus on maintaining male friendships, but like that's not working. I, I'm doing something wrong. I mean, do you have do you have some? So you he said you have friends, right? You know people. Yeah, I have my female friends up here that I maybe just be like Drake. You know, no new friends. Just stop trying to make these new <laughs> friends. Just <laughs> hang out with the existing <laughs> friends for a while. Oh, I like that. I think I should definitely, especially since we're in quarantine. Yeah. I'm still taking advantage of this. But you know, good for you for like picking up and moving. 
and taking care of your parents and you're doing a lot. So you can give yourself, you know, a minute to, you know, get some shit that you want to do taken care of, think about yourself and kind of think more specifically about what you want in a companion, like more than just hobbies, you know, is like the kind of person that maybe you could take a long road trip with or the kind of person that will puzzle with you or whatever. (laughs) But as opposed to like, well, he likes to hike, I like to hike. Which is, you know, I I just think it's a simplistic way to approach dating a little bit, but maybe it can give you some time. You know, think about some of the other, the more intimate things in your life, too, that you enjoy. and That's superficial. Well, yeah, and and maybe that will... Like surface level, superficial, not... (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, that and also maybe thinking about if you want um, a long-term serious relationship, what those quiet or more intimate moments are like does that make any sense yeah it totally does that's phenomenal because <laughs> like, i haven't i'm just like i'm panicking over the fact that i am having like i'm like oh no like what if i'm just too great like self-deprecating to every degree of like all the things i'm potentially doing wrong and and so i'm like maybe i should stop doing that like what what how can i change myself instead of like why don't i figure out what I actually want from companion. Do you find sometimes that a lot of your identity, like with your friends, is about you having emigrated from LA? Yeah, yeah. They like to talk about that a lot. And I have done a lot since a young in a short amount of time. And a lot of people that I've interacted with have never left North Idaho. So we sit around the bonfire and they want to hear some of my stories and stuff. And I don't know, I just it's it's all like it's not it's more storytelling, less emotional. Sure. Is leaving Idaho an option? Yeah, well, my dad just had a stroke, and my mom's sick also, and I take care of them. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but so they'd have to take them with me. That might be a little hard. But it is, like, it will be an option eventually. But you like Idaho. I think it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Savannah, I don't know, like, like sometimes when I go back to where I grew up, even then, like, the L.A., like the LA factor sort of looms. Yeah. Like it's just there. So just don't forget about that, that you may be viewed as like your name will be associated with LA for maybe another year. Maybe, you you know what I mean? Maybe a little bit longer, but people are viewing you in your environment through that lens. And that may not be helpful because it may be, it may be intimidating. Like projecting. Yeah. And then especially if you're outdoorsy, it's like they can't peg you as like, prissy LA. Yeah, <laughs> which they want to. <laughs> so I think that it's giving yourself some time to think about a lot of things that you would love in a partner, a lot of things that you would forgive in a partner. And then also just don't forget that your community there, they've all probably known each other for years. And yes, they have all yeah, of them. Yeah. So you, <laughs> in many ways, <laughs> yeah. So your guy might be right in front of you, but just know that there may be some hesitancy. I hope I'm not sounding um Don't say whatever you want. Well, <laughs> no, because okay. I because I don't want to be I don't want to be dismissive or demeaning towards any but yeah, that I I grew up in a in an environment that sounds similar, Savannah. Yeah. Where everybody knows all the kids play together, everybody like goes like every week. The parents all know each other. Totally. <laughs> So, Savannah, that would be my advice. I wish I could be more specific. <laughs> I appreciate that. I like, yeah. I like that advice because I haven't, like I said, I've just been self-deprecating. I haven't been like, what do I want? I'm like, how do I change to be what they want? Oh, yeah. I want to fit in here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. You know, I think it's amazing that you've been there for not even a year. You have great friends and you're positive and you seem to really love it. I, I am sorry about your folks, but I think it's incredible that you're working hard to take care of them. Oh, they're amazing. <laughs> they're blessed to have had them. Well, they raised an amazing person. <laughs> but yeah, don't forget, you know, to be selfish. I used to say that all the time on this podcast. I would always say, you know, be selfish in love. Yeah. My mom used to say it to me, and I didn't understand it, what it meant for a long time. But Savannah, I, I think that you should think about how you imagine an evening with somebody that you love in like five years from now, like what that looks like after the giddiness of, you know, the euphoria of the honeymoon. Yeah. And I love it that you're positive and you can laugh through this stuff. I think that's amazing. (laughs) I wish I had any advice, but I guess my only advice would be don't give the, the vehicular homicide guy another chance. You said you gave the other guy another chance. Yeah. Don't do that. That one's like mostly off the table. No, it's, I'm just kidding. It's, there's no shot for that. And maybe I won't fall for the meme trap anymore. Yeah, stay away from yeah. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> hey, Savannah, thanks so much. Well, thank you guys so much. Hey, thank you too. You guys are great. Bye, Savannah. Bye. Bye, guys.
Now I'm going to play some of your answers to last week's question. I really didn't know what to expect from this, and after listening to all of your messages, I was kind of overwhelmed by your honesty, vulnerability, and courage. You reminded me why I started this podcast, so thank you. Hey, it's Anna. Thank you so much for calling. So my first question is, to whom would you most like to apologize and why? I just want to start off and say, I've followed your show since the very beginning. I'm actually a mail carrier, so you keep me laughing and amused during this crazy time. The person I think I'd most like to apologize, mostly my dad. When I was a teenager, I was just so hard on him. And if I could go back, I would change all that because my parents are my favorite people in the whole world. I would most like to apologize to my son because, hey, I'm a sober drunk. And for much of his adolescent and teen years, I wasn't there for him, and that wasn't fair. He tells me it's okay, but uh, I went through that by myself, and it was painful. So that's that's who I would most like to apologize to. I would most love to be able to apologize to my ex-husband, who I had an affair on eight years ago. And I wish there were a way that I could apologize to him and to my children in a way that they would understand me better. I just feel like forgiveness is the best thing, and I, and I don't want him to forgive me for what I've done. I would just like to see him forgive so that he could move forward in his on his journey. Hi, Anna. I would most like to apologize to myself for all the years of self-hate and negative self-talk and everything like that, all the time I've spent in front of the mirror and all the tears that have been shed and for all the relationships I've run and just all the wonderful moments I've missed out on because I was too busy focused on what I didn't look like. I would choose both of my grandfathers who passed away, one when I was 18 and one two years ago, I never got to, to say goodbye to them, even though I had this feeling in the back of my head that I should have said goodbye, and I am sorry to them, but I never got that chance. I would most like to apologize to my son. I lost him in July of 2017. Um, he lost his battle with depression and bipolar disorder and took his own life. And I wish that I would have done more to get him more help, to get him someone more to talk to. And I feel like uh, I just didn't do enough to help him. And I would like to apologize to him for that. I would like to apologize the most to my parents and my sister. They've been such amazing support for me for my whole life. And about a year and a half ago, I got divorced and started seeing someone who was very bad for me. Um, I got into drugs and partying and things I never was a part of before. I've always been very responsible. Anyway, I lied to my parents consistently about my youth and pretty much avoided them for a long time. And my family never turned their backs on me. They bailed me out many a times, not from jail, thankfully, but um, financially and um, just were there for me when I finally ended their relationship. I could never apologize enough to them. And I know that they say I don't need to say I'm sorry, but I could never deal with the fact if anything happened to them and they didn't know how sorry I was and how much I love them. So that's what I'm sorry for. Hi, Anna. I would like to most apologize to myself, which might sound selfish or corny, but I think a lot of times people forget to give themselves the grace that they give others. And so I'm apologizing to myself for lots of negative self-talk and negative thoughts. Thank you so much for being a light in my world, and I hope you have a great day. Clark, thank you so much. And I yeah, can't wait you. to watch your movie. When does it come out? May, uh, 5th. May 5th. Yeah, my birthday. Oh. Hey, dear listeners. Clark Duke's directorial debut, Arkansas, is coming to... Apple, Amazon, VOD, Blu-ray, DVD. Literally everywhere but Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> on May 5th. I know I'm going to love it. You know, even if you hate it, maybe just lie to me. Okay. Clark, you're fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was fun. <laughs>